All right, well, hello, autoimmune warriors. I'm Dr. Eric Osansky, and in this video, I'm gonna talk about the relationship between adrenal fatigue and autoimmunity, and I'll also discuss whether or not everyone should do adrenal testing. So speaking of testing, the main reason I put together these videos is to help people with different types of autoimmune conditions better understand their test results so that they can find or remove their triggers, correct any underlying imbalances, and feel great again. Now, once a week, I release a video that focuses on testing, but what I've decided to do is create another weekly video that dives deeper into the potential triggers and underlying imbalances that I'll be covering on these test tutorial videos. So before I talk about the relationship between adrenal fatigue and autoimmunity, I'd like to briefly answer the question, does adrenal fatigue exist? When we think about the word adrenal fatigue, what essentially we're thinking about is over time, maybe due to prolonged chronic stress that the adrenals lose their ability to produce cortisol and DHEA, and as a result, the person becomes fatigued. And this is, isn't exactly what happens. Uh, there is a condition called Addison's disease, which is a, Addison's disease is an autoimmune condition, and that's what, due to the autoimmune process, the adrenals cannot produce sufficient amounts of cortisol and other adrenal hormones, um, but that's not what we're referring to when we talk about adrenal fatigue. So essentially, adrenal fatigue doesn't exist. Adrenals don't get worn out, but what happens is you do get something called dysregulation of the HPA axis, which is a hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And this dysregulation causes abnormalities in the cortisol levels. So a person might initially have hot elevated cortisol, and then over time, they might lose the ability to adapt, and, and the cortisol might get on the lower side. Again, is this adrenal fatigue? Well, some people will experience adrenal fatigue, or at least will experience fatigue due to the low adrenal hormones. But when I was dealing with Graves' disease, I had an adrenal saliva test and my cortisol levels were low and my DHEA was low and pretty much everything on the test was low. There were some other markers that were low. Secretary IgA is a marker that was tested for that was low. 17-hydroxyprogesterone was low, but yet I didn't feel fatigued. So it was an adrenal fatigue pattern without the fatigue. Uh, one might argue at the time I had hyperthyroidism, so I had an increased metabolic rate and that could have offset the fatigue. And there are people who have low cortisol and DHA who experience fatigue. And again, that's who we think of as having adrenal fatigue. But again, it's more of dysregulation of that hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, but it's easier to say adrenal fatigue. But again, HPA axis dysregulation doesn't always mean low cortisol, low DHA. Even if you have low, low DHA, high cortisol, that's a form of HPA axis dysregulation. So depending on who you ask, some healthcare practitioners will say that adrenal fatigue doesn't exist. Some will say it does exist. I'm going to talk about it as if it does exist, even though technically it doesn't exist. So does adrenal fatigue play a role in the development of autoimmune conditions? The research shows that there is a relationship between stress and certain autoimmune conditions. So I mentioned that I was diagnosed with Graves, and over the years I've seen a lot of other patients with Graves' disease. And in the research, there's definitely a correlation between stress and Graves' disease. This doesn't mean that stress always causes Graves' disease, but it can be a potential trigger or at least a contributing factor. And this is true with other autoimmune conditions as well. Again, in the research, there's, I can't say there's a clear-cut evidence of stress in every single autoimmune condition out there, but stress is a factor pretty much with any health condition. So if someone does have so-called adrenal fatigue, it definitely can play a role in the autoimmune condition. doesn't always mean that it's the main factor. I know when I was dealing with Graves, when I was, di I was diagnosed in 2008, and at the time I was in denial and I didn't think the adrenals and stress played a role in my condition. Um, but then when I saw the state of my adrenals and then thinking back and I realized, yeah, I probably didn't do as good of a job of handling the stress as I thought I did. But anyway, in my case, stress and the adrenals did play a role in the development of my condition. I'm pretty certain of that. So how does stress lead to autoimmunity? So even though th there is a correlation between stress and autoimmune conditions, what's, again, let's get a little bit into the research. So stress causes a dysregulation of the immune system and an increase in pro-inflammatory, or it can cause an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines and these pro-inflammatory cytokines are associated with autoimmune conditions. 
But then stress also decreases something called secretory IgA. So secretory IgA, that lines the mucosa surfaces of the body, different areas of the body, but especially the gastrointestinal tract. And it serves as a form of protection. And when secretory IgA is low, it makes you more susceptible to, to, to food allergens or especially infections, though. So in, infections are definitely, or certain infections are a trigger of autoimmunity. And secretory IgA can be tested, certain saliva tests, such as the adrenal stress index test from diagnostics. And certain comprehensive stool panels also test for secretory IgA. But those are some of the mechanisms in which stress can lead to the development of an autoimmune condition. So the next question you might have is, should you do testing for the adrenals? I like to test the adrenals on my patients. There are some healthcare practitioners. Well, I mean, most medical doctors don't test for the adrenals. Even endocrinologists usually don't test for the adrenals unless if they suspect someone has Addison's disease. And again, most primary care physicians won't do adrenal testing. And if they do testing at all, usually they'll do just a single cortisol sample, maybe maybe look at the DHEA. But I like doing some more comprehensive adrenal testing in my patients. And the reason is because everybody, or just about every, I won't say everybody, but, but most people have adrenal problems. And some natural healthcare practitioners will argue, well, since most people have adrenal problems, well, why don't we just treat the adrenals? And the reason for this is because People have different adrenal patterns, especially cortisol. Cortisol works according to a circadian rhythm, should be at the highest levels in the morning, lowest at the end of the day. And again, there's different cortisol patterns. And I have a video on this, and I'll include a link to the, that video in the description below. But obviously, there are some things you could do regardless of the pattern you, you have. So if, if you have high cortisol levels or low cortisol levels, you could eat well, diet plays a role in adrenal health, stress management is huge. Of course, if you could reduce stress levels, that's great, but a lot of people can't reduce the stressors, but almost everybody can do things to improve their stress handling skills. And getting more sleep is something that a lot of people can do. And some people want to get more sleep, but they can't. It's not, I mean, there are some people who just stay up late and they could work on going to bed earlier, but there's some people that try to go to bed earlier and they can't fall asleep or they fall asleep fine and they wake up in the middle of the night. So it's a catch 22 as we might have to do adrenal testing to see, do you have high cortisol levels at night or in the middle of the night? So again, there are, but there are things, my point is you could eat well, you can manage your stress, you could sleep better. And so these are things you could do regardless of your adrenal pattern. But if your cortisol levels are low, and if you're looking to take some support, so when I was dealing with Braves, again, I had low cortisol levels, and I took one of the, the herbs I took was licorice root, which helps to increase cortisol. And you don't want to take licorice root if you have high cortisol levels, obviously, because it's for low cortisol. And there's something called phosphatidylserine that's for high cortisol. So again, if you have low cortisol levels, you wouldn't want to take phosphatidylserine. Um, adaptogenic herbs, certain ones are fine to take either way. Ashwagandha is great for either high or low. Now, ashwagandha is a member of the nightshade family. So if you're on a strict autoimmune paleo diet, you might not want to take ashwagandha. A lot of my patients do fine with ashwagandha. But again, if you're strict AIP, then you might want to avoid ashwagandha. But there are some agents that you could take, natural agents, regardless of the pattern, but like adrenal glandulars. I, I don't give a lot of adrenal glandulars. Uh, I did more so in the past. And if you take adrenal glandulars, you usually don't want to take them longer than six to eight weeks. But adrenal glandulars, you wouldn't want to take if you have high cortisol. So that's typically when you, when you have low cortisol levels. And I've seen people take them when they just like either take them on their own or another practitioner recommends adrenal glandulars, regardless of the, the pattern. And as I mentioned earlier, you can't always go by symptoms. As I told my story, when I was dealing with Graves' disease, I had low cortisol, low DHEA, and I didn't feel fatigue. So I wouldn't have guessed that I had low, low cortisol, and low DHEA based on the symptoms. So, that, so, so again, I like to test different health. There, of course, other healthcare practitioners have different opinions, but there are a lot of healthcare practitioners that do testing and I will talk more about testing in the next video. So how long does it take to restore the health of your adrenals? Just as is the case with everything else, any other type of trigger or imbalance that you have, 
It depends on the person. Someone has a lot of stressors in their life. It's going to be more challenging to restore the health of their adrenals. And it's not just emotional stressors. That's big too. But even infections, infections can compromise adrenals. So if someone has a chronic infection such as Lyme disease or they have Epstein-Barr, and if that's causing problems with adrenals, then that could take time. I know when I was dealing with Graves' disease, initially I received an adrenal saliva test. And then three months later, I decided to do a retest. And not everybody does a retest. And like I said, we'll talk more about testing in the next video. But in my case, I retested because I wanted to see after three months how my adrenals looked. And they definitely looked a lot better. Not perfect at that point, but a lot better than, than they did when I got that first test. So it depends. I would say three to six months on average, some people longer than that. But again, the only way really to know for sure is to do a pre and post test. But a lot of people don't do retesting because of the, of the money. Some people don't do initial testing because, because of the money as well. But it does usually take some time to restore the health of the adrenals. So be on the lookout for my next video where I will discuss the different types of adrenal tests. And if you have any questions related to adrenal fatigue, please post them below and I'll catch you in the next video.